is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition with Francine Lacroix. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Francine Lacroix here in London, and here's what's coming up on today's program. Chinese consumers fuel the fastest economic growth in a year, but softness in industrial produ production weighs on Asian markets, while European stocks, though, for the moment, are in the green. State Street plunges the most in three years after customers withdraw $26 billion in the first quarter. Goldman Sachs and Bank of America report today. Plus, the chief executive of Polestar, Thomas Inglegoth, joins us from the Shanghai Auto Show as a luxury EV company tries to catch up with Tesla. Now, first thing is first, let's check in on the markets. We did have some data in China, broadly positive, but a bit of concern over wage growth and what that means for the reopening, how fast the reopening is, but also the trajectory of economic growth in China. Now, that weighed on Asian markets. If you look at Europe, they're actually holding on to a lot of the gains. European stocks uh, gaining some two-tenths of 8%. And then remember, I think it's on Thursday that we have six Fed speakers. So a lot of the markets are not looking only at the earnings season with a lot of the banks reporting, but certainly we'll focus on what we hear from these Fed speakers on central bank independence and how they see inflation going forward. Inflation complicating the matter with that unexpected wage growth for the Bank of England. So you can see sterling 124.28 and then Brent crude 84.86. Now let's look at the European map, but actually there's not a huge difference um, when it comes to, for example, the FTSE here over in the UK to the DAX. They're both gaining between one tenth and two tenths of 8%. So fresh data from China shows the economy growing at the fastest pace in a year, up 4.5% in the first quarter from a year ago. Now it was driven by stronger consumer spending, but also factors output following the end of COVID zero policies. For more on all of this, let's get to Bloomberg's China markets reporter, Sofia Orta Icosta. Sofia, thank you for joining us. So what are your key takeaways from the data? It's not all plain sailing. Yes, exactly. An uneven recovery, really driven by consumption. But let's not forget what was happening in March last year. This is when the Shanghai lockdown really came into effect. So when you see blowout numbers like retail sales up almost 11 percent, let's take that into context. It's a very low base, still a lot better than economists had forecast, Francine. Uh, the key weakness in the data was, of course, a fixed asset investment. Now, why this? Why does this matter? This is where uh, you can really kind of read into private sector confidence and where that is. And that was flat year year on year up about 0.6% uh, on the private sector. It's really still being driven by the public sector. The state state investment is driving the recovery and this is where the concern is. Youth unemployment also almost at 20%. That's almost at a record. So there's still a lot of challenges um, going ahead for Beijing and the recovery is not the V-shaped recovery that many people, many economists have been calling for. Francine. So Sophia, how did markets actually react and what, in, what are investors now looking for? That is the key question. Uh, no, this is really, it's its not the, the kind of uh, reopening boom that the most bullish investors had been kind of expecting, but it's also not weak enough for the PBOC to roll out more stimulus. So Francine, we're somewhere in the middle for markets where it's a difficult kind of macro read. Uh, when you And this is why, you know, when we saw the, the reaction in markets today in China, the yuan did strengthen a little bit, and then it gave some of those gains back. Again, in uh, the CSI 300, the index of mainland stocks was up about 0.3% last time. I checked. So really kind of a muted reaction. And this is because the PBOC, the central bank, won't cut rates anytime soon. We did see some economists raise the GDP uh, forecast for this year to above 6%. That is positive. But again, let's not forget how low that base was last year, Francine. Thank you so much, Sophia. Bloomberg's Sophia Orta Ecosta in Hong Kong. Now let's bring in Stephanie Niven, Portfolio Manager at 91. Stephanie, thank you also for joining us. I mean, this is an interesting day as we try and figure out, first of all, what's going on in China. Broadly positive with a couple of caveats uh, for real estate and, of course, wage growth. How, how do you play the China reopening? Sure. Well, I think we're really grappling with a lot of interesting, contradictory sort of news flow items coming out right now. It's very difficult for investors to really have any clarity on what's going on in the months and, and indeed in the years ahead. We're moving from one financial cycle into another where things are going to look very different. So for China, you know, we're seeing a lot of strong macro headlines, but you're right, it's not plain sailing. It's difficult and we will see that continue through the earnings season. We saw some really interesting news out, you know, in European luxury yesterday. Yeah. And that really speaks to that contradiction where we're seeing some strong growth come through in 
in China. But where does that cycle go? Where do we see that next leg up? It's very hard to say from here. So, Sam, where do we go, actually? So I've heard both things that, you know, interest rates are going to be elevated for quite some time. And then you, you look at certain indicators and partly due to financial conditions because of the you know, possible credit crunch coming, then inflation could come down quite quickly. Sure. I think rates stay longer, uh, stay higher for longer. Um, I think we continue to see banks commit to that, that, that mechanism of bringing down inflation. It's super important that we now start to see banks really commit to that goal that they've set. Yeah. They have two goals, that, that, that desire to um, continue to support em employment and to, support, uh, to keep inflation low. It's going to be that inflation side that we really see come through now. And into the second half of this year, we're pretty clear that we will see a recession. We will see that weakening. And at the moment, what we're looking for is that guidance coming through in, in, in the earnings season. So we're seeing those strong top line numbers. But what we could see is a strong earnings season, but with weak outcomes, because we will focus in on that guidance. That's where the eyes will be on that guidance coming through from companies. So, Stephanie, what kind of recession? Is it a long and protracted or deep recession because of policy mistake from the, you know, the Fed and other central banks, or it will be a shallow? I, we see it as very much a long and protracted. We're seeing a, a scenario where we are unwinding a lot of that loose, um, that cheap money that we saw in the last decade. And there are many deflationary pressures that really led to overinvestment, yep. that led to many manifestations. Those vulnerabilities will be unwound. We've seen it, you know, we saw it in the UK in September last year. We saw it in the US last month. We're beginning to see it in Europe and the market will continue to look those, for those vulnerabilities where we see an overinvestment, where capital has been too cheap. So what does it mean for earnings? Are, I mean, are we going to see, is the next earnings season going to be ugly or are we going to see a correction further down the line? We anticipate that earnings will look pretty good in this quarter. It's the guidance that we have to care about. So we're seeing that difference in, in CPI and PPI that came out in the US last week. So we're seeing strength in the top line with the beginnings of that unwind of, of the inflation on input prices, which is good for company margins, it's good for earnings right now, but it's that guidance, it's that predictability. And we'll see differences between in the industrial space where you've got that energy transition, you've got that structural growth dynamics at play, relative to perhaps the consumer discretionary space, where the ability to forecast on volumes is much more challenging than it was, say, five, you know, ten years ago. So, Stephanie, how do you look at it? Do you break it down industry-wise as you just have? and also you know in the consumer discretionary as you're saying it's very different from some of the higher end luxury that are benefiting from the China reopening or do you look at it regionally so it's very much about business model specific so we're looking for those businesses that can navigate through a tough recessionary period that can be resilient that can control their own volume and pricing growth that have a lot of conviction and visibility on their supply chain so it's, it's those businesses that are durable that have that quality of their business model that we really focus in on. It's looking for that structural growth that can um, come through even in a cyclical downturn, even in challenging macro environments. Are you expecting a credit crunch? We continue to see an unwind a lot of a lot of that loose, loose credit that we've seen in the last decade. So every cycle looks different. It's hard to say exactly what the manifestations will be. But those businesses that have done very well through the, the, the past decade that have put capital behind businesses uh, behind um, business products where perhaps that return threshold was was not as um, robust as perhaps ought to have been those are the vulnerabilities where we will see the market to continue to sniff them out the market will continue to look for these those are the businesses with which we believe we should be avoiding and looking to put our capital behind the resilient business models with control of their own destiny uh, what about some of the currencies so I know we talk a lot about dollar but if you look at sterling it's kind of on a tear I mean, it's really gained quite a lot. It, does it mean that the UK is back and open for business? I think it's very difficult to say. I mean, we saw the UK wage growth come out at the, this morning. I think it's very hard to say if the, what the, the, the Bank of England will do from here. Um, I think they will continue to commit to bring that inflation level down. What that means to the economy, you know, we will see those long, those varied impacts come through. So I think it's too early to say that the UK is out of the woods yet. All right, Stephanie, thank you so much for thank joining you. us today. Stephanie Niven there, Portfolio Manager at 91. Coming up, taking a bite out of India. Apple Chief Executive, see what we've done there. Apple CEO Tim Cook is in Mumbai as a tech giant sets its sights on the world's fastest growing major economy. We're live outside the news store next. This is Bloomberg.
Economics, finance, politics, this is Bloomberg Surveillance, early edition. I'm Francine Lacqua here in London. Now, Apple Chief Executive Officer Tim Cook is in India as the tech giant opens its first stores in Mumbai and Delhi. It underscores the company's growth ambitions in the world's fastest growing major economy and comes as Apple aims to reduce its reliance on China. Now, joining us now is Menka Doshi, our senior India editor in Mumbai. Menka, it must be so exciting to be there for, for the opening of the first store. Tell us what it's like. Well, it definitely is an exciting day for Apple, uh, Francine. First store in India, here in downtown Mumbai, a second one coming up in Delhi. And in between all of this, CEO Tim Cook, not just here to welcome the first few customers and interact with employees, but also hobnobbing with some of India's business leaders and slated to meet with Prime Minister Modi at the end of this week. Now, it's been a day of a lot of Apple hoopla, but you have to remember, this is Android country. This goes, though, for Apple. I mean, this is far bigger, I guess, than just sales, isn't it? Well, absolutely. I think uh, in a couple of India opportunities relevant to Apple, one is sales, as you pointed out, in order to be able to push sales because their current shares in India are very, very tiny. Local manufacture will help, which is what App Apple is emphasizing on. That helps re reduce import duties and makes their products a little bit less expensive. And that manufacturing ambition for Apple feeds into India's desire to also step up manufacturing here in the country that will boost jobs boost exports and that is the hope that India has from big players like Apple. Menka, thank you so much. Menka Doshi, they're in Mumbai. Now let's get straight to the Bloomberg First Word News. Here's Leanne Gerrans. Hi, Leanne. Hi, Francine. Bloomberg has learned that BlackRock is to begin selling failed bank asset assets, kicking off with mortgage-backed securities later today. This as the U.S. Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation looks to offload $114 billion of assets picked up from failed lenders, Signature Bank and SVB. The armed group battling the army for control control of Sudan has ruled out a ceasefire as diplomats struggle to halt fighting in the North African nation. Clashes continued throughout the day yesterday with some of the most intense violence around the main international airport and also the army headquarters. The UN's envoy says at least 185 people have been killed. Clients pulled $4.4 billion from Credit Suisse's European and U.S. funds after the UBS takeover. The data from Morningstar only includes funds that report daily numbers and doesn't cover all of Credit Suisse's asset management. The outflows underscore the challenge the firm faces to retain clients after the government-backed takeover. And SpaceX has delayed the planned test launch of its Starship rocket system, blaming a pressurization issue that emerged in the minutes before the scheduled liftoff. The uncrewed mission is a critical step in SpaceX's plan to send humans deep into space. Global News, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in over 120 countries. I'm Leanne Gerrans, and this is Bloom. Francine. Leanne, thank you so much. Now, coming up, we dive into the latest UK unemployment data this morning. What does that mean for the BOE and its next rate decision? We'll discuss that next. And this is Bloomberg. Economics, finance, politics. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Francine Lacroix here in London. Now, Sterling ticking higher this morning on the back of the latest UK jobs data. UK unemployment rate came in at 3.8% in three months to February. Regular pay growth unexpectedly picked up to a rather punchy 6.6% as well. Now, that also led, of course, our economics team saying, look, the pay surprise was too big to ignore. And so they're now expecting the Bank of England to hike in May. Now, here with us, a Bloomberg UK correspondent, Lizzie Burden, we're also joined by Christina Kina. So, Lizzie, break down the numbers for us. It was a huge surprise. Yeah, you mentioned the unemployment number, the wage growth number. Economic inactivity actually fell. But if you look at inactivity caused by long-term sickness, that's now at a record high. So, overall, the labour market tighter than expected. As you say, it ramps up pressure on the Bank of England to go again in May. Bloomberg Economics had seen a hold. Now they see a quarter point. Markets as well changing their bets, uh, raising where they see rates peaking in September. 
September from where they'd seen them peaking in on Monday. It also ramps up pressure on the government. You saw that strikes, uh, the number of days lost to strikes was 348,000 in September in February, up from uh, the January figure, three fifths of that is down to education, teachers striking. Yeah. That reflects the GDP data on Friday. The biggest weight on services output was from strikes. That's why growth only flatlined in February. So really pressure on the Chancellor Jeremy Hunt to talk to his ministers to find a way of settling with the unions. Yeah, and, and again, I mean, I don't know whether this changes, whether this is a blip also because it's seasonal and, you know, it's just hard to, to keep people in their jobs if they don't increase wages, or whether this could be a longer term trend. Yes, and we get the inflation numbers tomorrow. It's painful for consumers because their real incomes are falling, despite all of the rest of what we've just been talking about. And yet they may now have to put up with another hike from the Bank of England. So more pain potentially to come. The blip question will be speaking to Dan Hansen of Bloomberg Economics on the UK Politics podcast. I've just written myself a note to ask him this very question. Is the inflation print for February merely a blip? Lizzie, thank you so much. Bloomberg's Lizzie Burden there. Now let's also get more context on the markets. Here with us, Christina Kino, managing editor of Bloomberg Markets today, who also is in charge of this wonderful live blog. So you must be going like, Phew. okay, inflation is much higher than expected in terms of wage growth. What does that mean for pound going forward? Well, Francine, I think that's good news for the pound. I mean, just yesterday we were talking about how surprising it was that we have Sterling coming back from such a dismal 2022 performance and now at least at one point over the last few days, it was the best performing group of 10 currencies. So quite the three or 180 degree change there. And, you know, that really has to do with a little bit of the fading off or pessimism over the UK's growth trajectory, especially after Liz Truss's premiership transitioning over to Rishi Sunak. And then, of course, just the idea that, again, the Bank of England is going to have to keep raising rates. And it's very notable, again, the data today showing that wage growth unexpectedly rising. Andrew Bailey's not going to be happy to see that. For sure. No, I mean, no one probably on the NPC, apart from the ones that asked maybe for a, a, more of an increase. So the strong pace of underlying pay growth, is it something that's very UK focused or could we see a trend elsewhere in G7 economies? Well, I think in some ways the UK is kind of a laggard when it comes to wage growth. I mean, if you just kind of compare it, for instance, to the US, for instance, like salaries there in terms of the absolute levels are much, much higher. And they've actually already seen that wage growth increase over uh, the peak of last year, I would say. So in some ways, the UK is kind of experiencing what the US was experiencing around the same time last year into the spring and summer. And so this is kind of all coming to a head in a similar way. And I think, you know, again, as Lizzie was saying earlier, I think this dynamic is really too much for uh, both the Bank of England and the government to ignore. They're really yeah. going to have to address that wage situation, especially because, again, when you take into account inflation, real wages are still falling. So, Christine, when you look at, I guess, the undercurrents, right, that investors based here in the UK need to look at, apart from this unexpected wage growth, inflation then comes tomorrow. What else are you looking at? Well, Francine, inflation again, uh, top of mind. And I think this brings us just to the broader conversation of what is the strategy then when we have this uh, new era of persistent inflation? It looks like it's here to stay. It's not going back to target. When I mean, we have BlackRock again today saying that the 60-40 portfolio is now done. It's finished. They're jumping in that bandwagon. We know, though, that uh, many have tried to call the death of the 60-40 portfolio. That's probably something that investors in the UK, especially digesting this data talking about today and BlackRock in particular taking a look now at uh, alternative investments in the private and public space rather than the traditional 60-40 stock bond split. And, and maybe staying away from commercial real estate. I don't know, is that a huge problem in the UK or have we you know gone through most of the kind of the, the, the pressures that we're seeing elsewhere? Well, look, I mean, I think for me personally, that is the powder keg that I'm watching for. It is potentially the next canary in the coal mine to sing when it comes to, you know, a credit crunch and just signs of uh, just funding tightening for companies generally. I mean, I think in, in Europe more broadly, banks are sitting on more than one trillion euros of real estate related loans. And so that is potentially something that could give policymakers pause, not just in the UK, but Europe in, in general when they're considering these rate hikes. I mean, this is going to be one of the consequences uh, potentially that we'll see.
Christine, thanks so much. Christina Kino, their managing editor of Bloomberg Markets Today. And you can check out the Markets Today blog for all of the top stories in the UK and more. TLIV Go is a function on the Bloomberg terminal. You can also visit the Bloomberg UK website. Now, we'll be covering all things UK every week on Thursdays at 9.30 a.m. London time in our half an hour special. In the meantime, a lot of the focus is, of course, on what's happening in China. China's consumer-driven growth has been giving a boost to the global economy. Uh, that didn't play out so well in the Asian markets just because some parts of the data were a little bit disappointing. Here in Europe, though, we're still holding on to gains one-tenth of a percent higher. A reminder, GDP in China expanded 4.5 percent loss quarter from a year earlier. That's according to official data. Coming up, Swedish luxury EV startup Polestar has unveiled its new model at the Shanghai Auto Show. Its chief executive, Thomas Ingenloth, joins us for an interview next. And this is Bloomberg. Chinese consumers fuel the fastest economic growth in a year, but softness in industrial production weighs on Asian markets, while European stocks are in the green. State Street plunges the most in three years after customers withdraw $26 billion in the first quarter, Goldman Sachs and Bank of America report today. Plus, sterling pops as UK wage growth jumps unexpectedly, but an unwelcome boost to inflationary pressures. Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Francie Lacqua here in London. So we're excited now to go to the Shanghai Auto Show, where a duly owned Polestar is unveiling a new car to rival Tesla's Model Y. Well, Thomas Inglengloth, the chief executive officer of Polestar, joins us live from Shanghai. Thomas, great to have you on the program. Thank you so much for joining us today. It's so exciting here the buzz, of course, a lot of the foreign owned car makers over in Shanghai. First of all, what it's like, how much money do you have to spend to make sure that you nail that Chinese market? Yeah, hi, good morning, Francine. Uh, hello to Europe from the Shanghai Motor Show. Um, well, we are here in um, with, with two of our new models, the Polestar 3, which you see in the background, and our world premiere of the Polestar 4 here. And of course, it's a big, big investment of Polestar into our product lineup. The phase that we are in now, having established our markets, now the next two years we will be rolling out our product lineup, which of course is, um, as we always say with our asset light model, that is where our money goes into developing this product lineup of four really hot electric EVs. Yeah. So, uh, Thomas, at the moment, if you look at your cash burn, is it decreasing or is it actually widening? And how do you manage your funds? Do you need to raise money to make sure it goes into the development or the cars? Or, you know, is it through shareholders? How does that work? Well, it's, it's, it's a mix of um, all the instruments that are there. Of course, we have a really powerful shareholder base, our two main owners. Uh, backing us up, especially in times when capital markets are not that um, that easy. Having said that, um, 2023, we just simply uh, use the, the, the funding that we have. And of course, we are along the way looking at options. We definitely want to increase our shareholder base. We want to increase our free float and we will search for opportunities as they come uh, in a good way at the market. But we are not desperate to jump on uh, fast and quick things here. We definitely mm -hmm. will elaborate um, and wait for the good op opportunities. Have you seen any impact on the price war? What's your appetite on EV pricing? Do, do you have to be more affordable to, to win that? Well, you see, there's, of course, two different things happening. On one hand, EVs are getting slowly but steadily more into the mass market and therefore becoming more affordable. And of course, that is quite a um, fierce price competition in that. We are not, as a, as a brand poster, participating that much in it because we are obviously very clearly dedicated to the premium luxury segment. And on the other hand, one thing is clear in, in these days with 
Ukraine war, Inflation, where you have banks collapsing, generally, of course, a certain nervosity with the consumer market is, uh, I think, rather understandable. But of course, we believe that this will, in, in the course of the year, stabilize and be a seasonal um, effect and not a long-lasting one. So, so, Thomas, how do you see pricing going forward? And I know it's a very difficult question given we don't have a crystal ball over four, five, six years. But are you expecting prices to fluctuate or will they stabilize in the next 12 months? I think this is rather um, the, the stabilizing effect because you have two things working um, against each other. On one hand, of course, raw material prices will stabilize again rather um, than, than f go to new heights. They are rather stabilizing, coming down again. On the other hand, of course, the technology that we put into our cars, like you see here in the background, uh, Polestar 3 with a, um, with a LiDAR technology in our cars is, of course, getting more and more advanced. And of course, this has its price when you look into these modern technologies coming into the premium segment. And um, I think our customers, of course, they mm. are very much uh, into that tech. They want to pay for this great stuff. Um, till this demo, demo crisis and becomes something more affordable, of course, this is the normal mm. flow, how great technology goes into the mass market. It always takes some time. So Polestar plans to release three more electric performance vehicles through 2026. And I have to say, Thomas, looking at the cars behind you, they're, they're very good looking. How different will they be? Are they all for the same market? Currently, you're present in 27 countries. How do you adapt and adjust to, to the, the way we drive looking forward? Well, obviously, SUVs are worldwide a uh, big trend. We try to... Um, cater for that, but at the same time innovate. Our coupe SUV that we present here, I think, is a very, very advanced piece of uh, technology. I'm convinced that the China market will, of course, embrace this kind of new way, uh, a car without a rear window. But on the other hand, and that is the learning that we even have now with our Polestar 2 already in the European market, there is a big, big crowd out there that is really waiting for new innovative technology and um, is much less conservative than the car industry has been the last 20 years. So there I think we can find a great new appetite for new brands, for new technologies and newcomers. Thomas, when you look at Polestar, it's assembled in China for exports, but given the geopolitical tensions that are rising and also the Inflation Reduction Act in the US, how do you navigate that? Well, this is something that we definitely um, took already on addressing these topics. In the long term, anyway, spreading our production footprint more equal over the three regions where we have our customers was the agenda. We accelerated that now and have the Posta 3, the car that you see uh, in the background, um, not only with the production in Chengdu here in China, but as well in South Carolina in the US. So we will produce a Polestar 3 2024 in the US for the US market and as well for the export to Europe. So um, our production footprint over the next five, six years will develop and will equally to our customer base spread out over the world. Um, overall, what's your biggest challenge right now? I know, I know it's, a, you know, it's, it's research, I know it's, it's a pretty exciting space to be in, but if there was something that you had a magic wand that you could fix in the next six months, what would it be? <laughs> wow, that's a, that's a question because uh, it's almost every week that there's a new challenge. So if, I, ho I hope I can fix more than that <laughs> one that you give me now. Um, <laughs> One thing that maybe maybe a challenge that I would love to fix that we for once not have every week new challenges popping up, but a little bit more of a um, of a rational, stable world. 
So what was your challenge last week? I like this idea, and it's true. It feels like that in the news, right, that every week there's, there's something maybe unexpected that could happen. What was last week's challenge? <laughs> Um, what was last week's challenge? Well, you have things popping up which you, you didn't even hear of that. For example, I mean, we obviously have a lot, a lot of logistic to organize and that suddenly logistic companies that you have been working with for um, decades, not us, but for example, Volvo have been working us suddenly to decide to not serve certain routes anymore and you're desperately searching for somebody to ship your cars. I mean, things like that um, popping up. Of course, we always find solutions for it, but uh, it's amazing what kind of new challenges there are uh, coming up every week. Yeah, good luck. So maybe I'll give you three or four magic ones. Thomas, thank you so much for a great interview. Don't be a stranger. We hope to see you also in the London studio. Thomas Ingenloth there, the chief executive officer of Polestar. Coming up, Elon Musk wants to join the AI race with a system of his own to rival Microsoft and Google. Well, we have a panel of guests to discuss venture capital funding in the AI space, as well as a thorny issue of ethics and regulation. That conversation is next, and this is Bloomberg. Economics, finance, politics. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Francine Lacqua here in London. Now, Elon Musk wants to create a rival to the much talked about Chat GPT. The Tesla chief executive confirmed in an interview that he's planning to get involved in the AI race, which is currently led by Microsoft and Google. However, Musk has not volunteered any further details on the system that he actually wants to create. Now, for more on the AI race and investing in the space, we're joined by Reshma Sohoni, co founder and managing partner at Seed Camp. Reshma, thank you so much for joining us. We talk about AI and people either freak out or are very excited about what the future is. If you look at the truth, it's probably somewhere in the middle. What are you most fearful of and what are you most excited about when it comes to the AI and how it will transform our world? I, I think you said it right. I think it is somewhere in the middle. Um, I, I think there's sort of two avenues. There is, you know, AI as almost another, a new language, a new way of building systems and Ultimately, I think in a, in a very benign way, I guess if you're selling into enterprises or even, you know, even us consumers on a, on a usability, it's the day to day, how can I be better? How can I be better at living my life or as an enterprise, how can I be better at generating more revenue or cutting my costs? That's sort of the benign way of, of AI. And then I think the other, uh, you know, the other side as such, which has created um, quite kind of two, two, uh, two sets of opinions, right? Whether we need more regulation, we need, you know, more scrutiny is the general intelligence. And what does that mean for, for humanity? And so there's obviously um, a lot of, I would say, even short term panic around that. And, and, and generally where how AI is headed towards a more general intelligence. Um, so, you know, two, two very different areas and, 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 and different people focusing on different things. So, uh, Reshma, again, w when you look at some of the challenges, right, going forward of AI, is it right, uh, a lot of people are asking for a, a six-month moratorium so that regulators get their act together. I don't know whether six months is too long or actually not long enough. Where do you stand on this? Uh, I mean, uh, maybe at the at the very start of it, I, I don't know how you create that either, a moratorium on, on what exactly. Um, is it around the, the language models? Is, is it around the application layer? You know, there isn't even any kind of uh, an alignment on, on, on exactly what to create a moratorium on. And as you said, I think we're such beginning innings of this whole kind of technology evolution, revolution perhaps, it, it is very difficult to tell the timeline, um, whether six months is, is, you know, scratching at the surface or, or whether that's good enough. For, for much more alignment and, and focus on exactly where, you know, we should be, we, we should be pressing the pause button. So, Rashma, when you look at AI, what are some of, if you break down actually what some of your concerns are, because, again, in this space, because it could really change, you know, how, how many people work, how we think, there's also the worry about fake news and how you get onto this deep fakes, that everything's a little bit muddled. And so people, again, see AI as, as this big transformative thing. But when you look at it rationally, what should we worry about in the first six months, in the first eight months, and then three years from now? 
I, I think uh, focus and alignment, I think that al alone is going to take us six months is, you know, as I said, AI is at the formative kind of model layer and um, the fundamental large language models that are used, the sort of, you know, the, the chips and the technology around the capacity uh, resource use around that and then the application layer. And to be honest, as a, as a venture capitalist, we tend to focus on the application layer. And I would say there is not much of a difference there or, or that much to focus on. So, I mean, I think as um, as participants, you know, in a global system, as as folks in on the regulatory side, I mean, the focus really matters is what, you know, what should we be focused on? And I think it is on that general intelligence side, um, not necessarily on the application side. And then, and also alignment across governments. I mean, I, I would say, you know, we're at a low point in global alignment, um, governments, private versus public, we're at a very low point. And I would, I would really focus on that is how do we have conversations um, across borders, across sectors, and again, get alignment on what we need to really focus on with general intelligence and what there is to actually, you know, regulate and how. how what would you regulate first? Reshma, is it f fake news? And what, when you look at some of the images, we're just looking at images of the Pope. I mean, it's extremely difficult to get a handle of it. And, and when you look at governments, you wonder if you look at, you know, the G7 economies or even the G20 economies, what government really has a good handle of understanding AI and what's the best way to regulate it? Yeah, uh, maybe I should be in that job then if I, if I definitely knew the answer. But um, <laughs> I, I would say, look, I think we're moving, going to be moving into more of a, you know, trust-based system, right? A lot of, if you think about cybersecurity, you're always catching up to whatever the latest innovative threats are. And so I think it, it you know, it is about regulating around trust systems. And I mean, GDPR was, was one stab at it before, you know, before kind of the, before AI has been taking over all our all our all our uh, brain space as such. So I mean, it, it is I think having certain goalposts and saying you know tr trust is going to be more and more important. And you know whether it's whether it's regulating at the company level or at again fundamental kind of content level. I think that's that's yeah. where I would fo focus on. So, Reshma, for, and I know basically what you do is, you know, support, spot and support some of uh, the startups that will be the, the big tech companies, hopefully of tomorrow. When you look at AI, who's doing well in the space? Because we're also talking at cross purposes at times. We talk about AI, but the supporting system could be different from one conversation to the next. Absolutely. We have a couple of companies. Actually, it's, it's interesting. And, you know, Deepfake is one way to look at it. We have a company called Synthesia. What they actually help is in video creation, which is the which is the photo you put up, right? But companies are using that um, to actually lower their cost of production. Videos is, is massively costly, and also to increase revenue by going into d different markets. So, you know, we, we do believe we're in in there to help companies do better with this technology. We have a company called Viz.ai um, that's helping you know helping understand sort of stroke and get to get to get that care and analysis faster. So I think um, whether in climate, whether in biology, there's some pretty amazing for good advances. We hope we're, we're a big part of that, uh, you know, while looking also at sort of what are the value systems of these companies and how will they ensure they have a work, they have a team actually in place, you know, against some of the more nefarious uses of, of, uh, uh, of this technology. Um, Reshma, let's also bring in Ekaterina Almask, general partner at Open Ocean, who also helps us drive the conversation forward. Ekaterina, when you look at AI and when you look at some of the companies, some of the investments that make sense now, you, you know, this could potentially, if it follows and continues unabated, change the way we do Google search, the way we teach in schools, the way we do our jobs, and the list goes on and on and on. What gets disrupted first that makes sense for an investor to get in on now? So there are plenty of opportunities in artificial intelligence now, and we do see that we are entering actually the new era of automation. Uh, so we are looking at big markets like job market, like uh, in uh, HR, in um, education being disrupted. The issue with what we are seeing um, as investors is that AI is still quite a nascent market in a way. And in order to scale uh, to big uh, opportunities, we need to find tools and the right models to actually scale it faster and, and, and enable enterprises to make it happen. 
Ekaterina, is this, are these companies or does it make more sense searching for companies in the U.S. or are there also opportunities elsewhere in the world? So we see actually innovation coming from everywhere these days. Uh, as an investor across Europe, we are open ocean. We invest in the early stage companies across Europe, Pan European Fund. So we do see innovation coming from anywhere. And you see innovation coming from the UK, from Germany, but also from Eastern Europe. So basically, there are team, advanced teams. Um, for instance, uh, the startup can be in Zurich, but their development is in Bulgaria, and they have amazing talent uh, building one of the most innovative solutions in the world. So we do see opportunities in the US, of course, as usually, but also in Europe, there is an amazing wave of innovation coming out of Europe. Thank you so much for joining us. Ekaterina Almask, General Partner at Open Ocean, and Reshma Sahoni, Co-Founder and Managing Partner at SeedCamp. Now, we'll be continuing, of course, a conversation about AI throughout the day. That's as we look ahead to the start of Bloomberg's new dedicated show called AI IRL that launches tomorrow, spanning 12 episodes. The series will cover the implications of AI in everything from love to warfare and medicine to space. So more ahead. This is Bloomberg. Well, State Street shares plunged the most in three years yesterday after the custody bank reported that clients retreated from its investment products and that the outflows probably are not over. Well, let's bring in Bloomberg's Charlie Wells for more. Charlie, who is also telling you about credit cards and what you should get and shouldn't get. So, Charlie, it's really a wealth of information. That's the thing you should know. So, Charlie, how bad are these earnings for both Schwab and State Street? These are bad, and this really was a surprise. I think we went into this earnings season with the stakes high, right? We're following off some of the most dramatic banking news since the financial crisis. And actually, when you look at State Street, one of the America's largest custody banks, they were expecting deposit inflows of $8 billion in Instead, it was outflows of $26 billion. So that really sent the share price reeling yesterday. It was the worst for performer in the S&P 500. Also, Charles Schwab in their earnings, they showed compared to the same period last year, their deposit base down 30%. So what we are seeing is deposits are on the move. So, Charlie, we're obsessed with this story. It's basically how much will banks have to pay to keep depositors happy in the U.S. and elsewhere? This is a battle. And look, we just saw Apple release this new product pairing with Goldman Sachs, offering 4.15% to savers. I mean, savings accounts have been incredibly boring over the past decade or so, but suddenly they're starting to heat up. We're seeing American consumers start to look at things like money market funds in huge amounts. We're starting to see, you know, um, treasuries. Even Series 1 savings bonds have been sort of the darlings of social media, and those are attracting a lot of money. So banks could feel pressure. Okay, and, and also Charlie can save you money, so if you have any questions on credit cards, email. Them. I hope your DMs are open on Yes, Twitter. my DMs are open. <laughs> That's not true. Charlie Wells, thank you. We'll have plenty more. Bloomberg Servants Early Edition continues next from New York. This is Bloomberg. earnings. But beyond just the earnings, it's much more, you know, what is the liquidity position for banks? If the banking data massively improves, um, all of the doom and gloom goes away. What the market is pricing here is a terminal rate for the Fed, which is slightly lower than what we had prior to the banking crisis. Tightening credit conditions, but still sticky inflation. It's a, it's a, you know, difficult combination for central banks in Europe or in the US to deal with. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition with Anna Edwards and Matt Miller. It's 10 a.m. in London, 5 a.m. in New York, and 5 p.m. in Hong Kong, our top stories today. Mixed economic picture, Chinese consumers fuel the fastest growth in a year, but softness in areas including industrial production casts a shadow on the recovery. Meanwhile, Apple looks beyond China. CEO Tim Cook officially opens the company's first retail stores in India, ushering in a new era for both sales and manufacturing. And bank earnings roll on. Goldman Sachs and Bank of America report today, followed by results from another 
another batch of regional lenders that could set the tone for the market. Welcome to Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Anna Edwards in London with Matt Miller in New York. And the China data, Matt, mixed to positive overnight. Not having a huge impact on market sentiment, though. We build our way towards bank earnings, which could, uh, as we said in our headlines, set the tone. Yeah, I think bank earnings are definitely going to be key to watch today. Of course, the China data has an effect on local markets. We'll see that in Asia in just a moment. We do see S&P futures up about two-tenths of 1%. And this after we closed up in the cash trade yesterday about a third of 1%. So um, even though there's so many stories out there about the bearish sentiment and how lonely it must be um, for buyers, there's still more of them than sellers right now. U.S. 10-year yields coming down just a little bit, really unchanged at 359 47. So this is interesting, the move up you've seen over the past few days. We were down um, before I went to Austin on Thursday in the 340s, and now we're up uh, at basically 360. The dollar index continues to move lower right now, and if you look at the pound charts or uh, the euro charts, you'll see that really pronounced move up for those currencies. Right now, the Bloomberg dollar index at 1223, and Bitcoin holding steady right now at 29,719. So not a lot of movement from um, the original crypto asset around $30,000. Take a look at Asia because this is where it gets, I think a little bit more interesting this morning. The broader Asia Pacific index is unchanged. And we do have in terms of regional indexes, a lot of losers across Asia. The Hang Seng um, is down six tenths of a percent in Hong Kong, uh, but the Nikkei is gaining or gained at the close to a half a percent. So there are some gainers. The CSI 300 was also a gainer in the mainland uh, uh, of China. So you, you have some split there, and that's why this is really unchanged. You do have a weaker dollar against the yen as well. You can now buy 134, just over 134 yen for your dollar. But watch this space because it seems more people are bearish on the dollar as well. Anna, what do you see in Europe? Yeah, the FX move, certainly a focus here in Europe, Matt, as is the China data. This is the picture for Europe then. Pretty uh, muted gains, really, across the European equity space for the major markets, at least, up by 2 to 4%, uh, tenths of a percent, sorry, on the major markets this morning. The China data having an impact on basic resource stocks, lifting those as one of the early gaining sectors in Europe. We just got some data out of Germany. Uh, the German April ZEW investor expectations number, that's fallen to 4.1. The estimate was a reading of 15.6, so that looks to be much weaker than expected. And this is a survey of the expectations of the investment community, economists and other financial professionals, maybe not feeling as, as buoyed up as we might have anticipated. These are some individual stocks I pulled out as of interest today, as, uh, along with the macro theme around FX that Matt mentioned. Uh, so we'll get to that in a moment. Here are the, the stock specifics. Easy, EasyJet, the uh, low-cost aviation uh, business, up by 2.2%. They've upgraded their guidance, pushing ahead towards a strong summer in their view. Ericsson is down by 7.5%. The telecom equipment manufacturer producing results that beat estimates but suggesting there could be a choppy year ahead in 2023. Some geographies they say uh, that are ahead on 5G dialing back their investment on that particular technology and GSK we talked yesterday about pharma M&A Matt and so here's another one fairly small in the pharma space two billion dollars but they're buying a Canadian biotech business so I put that in here uh, moving the stock just only, only so fractionally if at all and the pound is as you say stronger against that weakness in the US dollar but the euro is stronger that ZEW number didn't seem to shake the euro strength and the pound is stronger a broad dollar weakness maybe but also the data we got out on wages certainly had a positive impact on the pound pushing it higher at least in that sense positive because the wages data stubbornly high in the uk not falling as had been anticipating actually on the rise once again matt a ton of MA, by the way if you look at drugs uh, if you look at video games, if you look at electric instruments, if you look at commodities, we're talking about, you know, 40, 50 billion dollars over the past week alone. So we'll continue to cover that story for you. Right now, let's get back to the Chinese economy because fresh data show that that economy grow uh, is growing at the fastest pace in a year, up four and a half percent in the first quarter from a year ago, driven in part by stronger consumer spending after the reopening. Morgan Stanley, chief China economist, spoke on Bloomberg earlier. We do think if China can maintain that growth, it's still able to cross so-called middle income trap, becoming a high income economy by next year. So even if they want more quality growth, they still need a certain growth level. And at this moment, the year to date, it looks like they are on track to reach that growth. And we are looking for another about 5% growth for next year. 
Joining us now from China, from Beijing, is uh, Bloomberg's China Economy Editor, James Mager. So what do we make of this data, James? Um, is it a surprise to the upside? The consumer, the strength of the consumer recovery, I think, is a surprise to the upside. There had been a lot of, you know, people saying that they were you know, still worried about how consumers were spending. January and February here was a kind of extended holiday, and there was a lot of the hangover from basically everyone in China getting COVID in December. And so there had been some concern that consumers weren't going to come back, that they were going to, weren't going to spend the money they'd saved over the last three years. And it seems, at least in March, that there was a real rebound in, in consumer demand. Partly that's because uh, last year was so weak, but also it does seem that there has been people were going out and were spending, not flowing through to the housing market so much yet, but on other consumer goods, there was a lot more spending, people going out to restaurants, uh, going out to shops, seeing the movies, those kind of things, definitely seeing a pick up on those things. On the industrial side, it's a little bit disappointing, wasn't as strong as expected, but you know, across the whole economy, across services, you know, the domestic demand seems to have been stronger in the first quarter than I think a lot of people had been mm. expecting. OK, so the retail story playing strongly. We've certainly seen that in, in recent reports from some of the luxury businesses here in Europe. We also uh, track, of course, the geopolitics, James, and that's been moving overnight. Uh, Taiwan is buying as many as 400 land-launched anti-ship missiles from the United States. How surprising is this kind of move and, uh, and what will be the effect? So this is a deal that the Taiwanese initially did in 2020 um, to buy these missiles. And they already have those, the same missiles that are on their destroyers and other naval vessels. So it's not a new capability for them. But there's a lot more, obviously, you know, they're, they're buying up to 400 of these now. And you know, other nations are also doing the same. Japan has a billion, I think a $3 billion program to increase their, capacity, their missile capacity. Again, anti-ship missiles to try and bottle in the Chinese Navy if it ever, you know, is ever threatening Taiwan or Japan's southern islands. So there is a real sort of arms race happening in East Asia right now. The Japanese, the South Koreans, the Chinese, the Taiwanese, and obviously the U.S. as well are all sort of increasing their military capability because of the, the various threats that they see. For Taiwan, this is obviously a, this is going to strengthen their ability to resist a Chinese invasion fleet if it happens. But you know these mis these aren't going to, this isn't going to happen overnight. I mean, Boeing now has to make these missiles and then ship them to Taiwan. So this is going to be a story to follow over the next few years. It's not like these missiles are going to be on a plane heading to Taipei anytime in the next couple of weeks. Yeah, I mean, I just think it's interesting because we're selling them missiles and yet we don't even recognize them as a sovereign nation. I wonder how often that happens. James, thanks so much for joining us. James Mager coming to us out of Beijing. Let's get to the corporate news right now. Um, in, I guess, the region in, in Asia, right? Apple CEO Tim Cook has opened the iPhone maker's first store in India. The move underscores the company's growth ambitions in the world's fastest growing major economy and comes as Apple aims to reduce its reliance on China. Manaka Doshi, our senior India editor, joins us now from outside the new store in Mumbai. So, Manaka, tell us first off about Cook's visit. Uh, well, it's been an exciting day for Apple here. You've seen the crowd wane a bit, but there were a few thousand people here earlier in the day. This is the first Apple store in India. Right behind me looks like any other Apple store anywhere in the world, though not as iconic as the Cube in New York. But it has all the other features, and it also had on opening day CEO Tim Cook standing at the door welcoming many of the first customers. Tim Cook is then headed to Delhi to inaugurate the second store, and it's likely that in Delhi he will also meet with Prime Minister Modi. Now, this is not a story about two stores. It's a story about two opportunities in India for Apple. That is a revenue opportunity. It's very tiny in the Indian market right now. It could potentially grow that. It's a story about diversifying its supply chain away from the China dominance to other countries like India. For India, it's an opportunity to see if Apple can do for this country what it did for China, which is build a manufacturing ecosystem that eventually leads to more jobs and more exports. Mm, yes, that's important to, to linger on, isn't it, Menke? This, we're focused today on the sales opportunity because that's what opening this new store, these stores, is all about. But this is also about geopolitics. It's also about diversifying a supply chain. It's about manufacturing. 
Absolutely. And Apple, I must say, has a long way to go. If you take a look at the numbers, I think India manufactures something close to 7% of iPhones, uh, global iPhone manufacturing capacity for Apple. Now, China is over 90% of iPhones to AirPods. Uh, so it's going to be a long haul for Apple to build out that kind of manufacturing capability here in India. But that's what India is counting on. All right, Manaka, thanks very much. Manaka Doji uh, reporting there from Mumbai. Really appreciate your time this morning and great to get over to India. Let's get back here to the U.S. Brookfield defaulted on a $161 million mortgage for a dozen office buildings, mostly around the Washington, D.C. area. This comes as borrowing costs surge and office occupancy, of course, continues to take a hit from the rise in remote work or the resilience of that. Chanali Basic, our global finance correspondent, joins us now for more. And Chanali, this is key, right, because a lot of banks have commercial real estate on their books. They certainly do, certainly in the form of CMBS. And remember, the reason a lot of this happens is for a renegotiation process in the CMBS process. Brookfield, of course, is a giant in the room here, but we have seen other giants like Blackstone, WeWork, also default on certain office properties really around the world. Brookfield, for example, in Los Angeles had defaulted on a CMBS tied to Los Angeles Towers. Uh, we work as well. We had mentioned for Blackstone, uh, a set of properties in Finland tied to office properties. So again, this is a worldwide phenomenon, really. These are small parts of the portfolio. A Brookfield spokesperson had said 95% of what they own are still trophy Class A buildings. All office is not created equal, but cracks under the surface are certainly being watched as we watch the uh, CRE market, the office buildings in particular. And again, the regional start to report this week, some of which have very heavy exposures to commercial real estate loans. Yeah, so the rising rates environment, a feature there then, Shanali, and, and a driver there. It's also going to be a feature and has been a feature of the bank earnings season that we've seen so far. And we take that on further today, don't we? Hearing from uh, Goldman Sachs and B of A. Yeah, it's re very interesting. Remember, from Bank of America, the net interest income outlook will be really interesting after J.P. Morgan raised theirs very significantly last week. Remember, most of the banks we've watched so far have also started to show higher provisions for loan losses as well. So does Bank of America, which has been very sanguine over the last couple of years, really start to show a similar story about some weakening of economic conditions as it pertains to the consumer. On Goldman's front as well, remember just yesterday, Apple and Goldman debuted their savings account with a luscious yield, let's call it, hmm. at 4.15% uh, here. That is on the higher range. It's certainly higher than Goldman's own account. Remember Remember, Apple is trying to grow in financial services, but for Goldman today, as it reports, remember the fixed income numbers will be of notice as J.P. Morgan City Group have beat, but the consumer business has been called. Gerard Cassidy over at RBC called it an albatross because it's a business that's not expected to break even until 2025. As we mentioned, those provisions for loan losses have been hanging over the necks of a lot of the banks, and certainly for Goldman Sachs, for profitability in that unit, it's a question mark as they figure out what to to do with that unit moving forward. So still unanswered questions okay. for Goldman, but um, hopefully surprising numbers here in the core businesses. Maybe a few answers then today. Shanali, thank you very much. We're both Shanali Basak with the latest on the banking sector and beyond. And coming up in the next hour, in this hour of program, sorry, uh, we will be talking bank earnings. We'll speak to Octavio Morenzi, Optimus co-founder and CEO. We'll get his thoughts on the banking sector, where the opportunities lie and what we are learning as we go through these reports. We'll also talk to Chris Watling, Longview Economics CEO and Chief Market Strategist. What opportunities does he see here and now in stocks versus bonds and longer term? What's his view and his view on inflation? This is back. Welcome back to Bloomberg Surveillance. This is the early edition. I'm Matt Miller here in New York with Anna Edwards in London. We are looking at a VIX, and a lot has been made of this fear gauge falling down now below 17. Does that mean we're in for a lot of relative calm in these markets? No more volatility. Joining us now to talk about this is Bloomberg Markets Live editor Eddie Vandervault. Before I get your answer to that question, Eddie, um, does the VIX really matter anyway? Why are we focused on this gauge yeah. that seems to be, um, you know, made 
so much less important by zero days to expiry options. Right, that's exactly right. I think, I think you know, as, as people move away from the longer-term options, uh, it, it, it has become less relevant. That, that's, that is an absolutely key point. And it does feel a bit like, you know, we're seeing the VIX fall, but it doesn't feel like it's falling, right? It does feel like there's this undercurrent of volatility still remaining in markets. So perhaps it is not as relevant um, as, as, it has, as it has been in the past. Um, at the same time, though, you know, I, I, there, there are definitely buyers out there. We are seeing people you know, maybe not optimistic about the short-term fundamentals, but saying, look, at some point, even if the, if the U.S. enters a recession, we're going to come out of it, the Fed's going to, are going to cut rates again, and it's all going to be good again. So, you know, I don't buy this narrative that this is an unloved uh, rally mm. by any stretch of the imagination. There, there's plenty of that narrative around there, there isn't there, Eddie? I mean, Matt was talking there about the VIX and the messages uh, that are coming there. The, the, uh, also, I was looking at the Bank of America investor survey. You know, this comes out periodically and tells mm. us interesting things. Again, there we see that that survey shows that investors are the most underweight stocks versus bonds since 2009 as recession fears grow. Right. Yet, in the, in the short term, stocks keep on rising. Right, and, and, you, and you do have... Uh, you, you know, you do have uh, the, the, the bond market offers you good yield at the moment, which draws money away from equities, obviously. And then if you expect yields to fall, then bonds are a double, doubly good bet. But at the same time, bonds and stocks have been positively correlated and probably will remain so because I think any, any you know, positive fundamentals that we see coming out of this will be based on a Fed cutting rates. Um, and, and therefore, you know, I think that, that narrative of stocks and bonds correlated, that continues as the year drags on. Eddie, thank you very much. Bloomberg's Eddie Vanderbilt joining us with his thoughts on the markets from uh, the Markets Live team. And you can get further market analysis from the team. MLIV Go is the function to use on your Bloomberg terminal. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Matt Miller in New York with Anna Edwards in London. Now, keeping you up to date with news from around the world, here's the first word. Video released today by the Kremlin shows Russian President Vladimir Putin meeting officers Luhansk uh, and Kherson um, in those two regions, the occupied regions of Ukraine. It's the second time in a month that Putin has toured the newly seized territories. Ukrainian forces are preparing to mount a counteroffensive. Kiev hopes will provide a decisive breakthrough. Meanwhile, Russia has shelved plans for an offensive of its own after failing to gain much ground. UBS says it will use some shares that it repurchased over the past year to finance the acquisition of Credit Suisse. According to a statement, the Zurich-based lender bought back about 299 million shares. Switzerland's largest bank says it's using repurchased stock because it didn't want to issue new shares for the $3 billion deal agreed last month and a government-brokered rescue without consulting shareholders. Bloomberg has learned that BlackRock will begin selling failed bank assets, kicking off with mortgage-backed securities later today. This as the U.S. Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation, the FDIC, looks to offload $114 billion of assets picked up from failed lenders Signature Bank and SVB. And the Wall Street Journal reports that McKinsey and Bain are delaying start dates for its new MBA hires. Bain is telling MBAs with offer letters that if they want to start in April of 2024, the firm will pay them $40,000 to work for a nonprofit or $30,000 to learn a new language or participate in an educational program. Meanwhile, at McKinsey, many MBA hires reportedly don't have start dates yet. The company is in the process of laying off as many as 2,000 workers. So it looks like uh, you could get paid for taking a course, maybe even in another country. So you could travel and you could go, mm. you know, say um, to Berlin and learn German or to Rome and learn Italian and, and get paid 30 grand for it if you were going to start for Bain now. It sounds like. Sounds like you're, you're making some plans there, Matt. Well, yeah, I haven't been accepted one, <laughs> as, as yet to the program, no. but...
No. Small detail. We can, we can dream. Uh, but that, that's an interesting one, isn't it? I mean, clearly there's a longer term, bigger picture story, which is around job losses in financial services and perhaps around this particular part of the, of the professional services arena. But is there something about sentiment in here as well? I wonder how many of the, of the clues we're getting around sentiment are a little dated because of the turmoil we saw in markets in March. We just got that ZEW data at the top of the hour, Matt, which is, of course, finance professionals in Germany, how they feel about things right now. And that unexpectedly uh, sh showed a, a big drop downwards I just wonder how much of that is dated how much of that is because everybody felt very gloomy in March and these are people who are very close to that kind of uh, market movement well we're gonna hear a lot of those answers in bank earnings this earnings season right or, or really company companies mm. this earnings season should tell us a lot about what we know now rather than what happened yes. with SVB how much we've moved on or not exactly we'll talk to Chris Watling shortly Longview economic CEO and chief market strategist that conversation coming up soon this is Bloomberg This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. Here's what you need to know. Mixed economic picture. Chinese consumers fuel the fastest growth in a year, but softness in areas including industrial production casts a shadow over the recovery. Meanwhile, Apple looks beyond China. CEO Tim Cook officially opens the company's first retail stores in India, ushering in a new era of sales and manufacturing. And bank earnings roll on. Goldman Sachs and Bank of America report today, followed by results from another batch of regional lenders that could set the tone for the market. I'm Anna Edwards in London with Matt Miller in New York. And Matt, so the focus is going to be as we go through the U.S. session, very much on the bank earnings, futures as we wait for that, suggesting a little bit of positivity this morning. Yeah, it does seem like investors are expecting some good things to come out of bank earnings or earnings season in general. Maybe expectations had been set way too low. Obviously, analysts um, tend to uh, under price what's going to happen or underestimate um, uh, revenue and uh, earnings at companies to the tune of about 76 percent. That's the average uh, beat in the S&P. Futures are up about three tenths of one percent and we closed the cash trade up about this much as well on Monday night as well. So um, the gains just keep coming, right? The S&P is up, I think, 8.2% so far year to date. So if there are a lot of bears out there, um, they're not really uh, putting their money where their mouth is and selling. The U.S. 10-year yield is unchanged right now at 360. 359.08 is the actual level. Um, but that's moved up about 20 basis points in the past two sessions. Um, and that should provide a headwind, I would think, to stocks as well, right? If you can get more um, from fixed income, especially riskless fixed income, why would you put your money in stocks? Um, nonetheless, investors are doing that. The dollar index is down. It's been obviously trending lower, but it's been holding at this 1223 level for, uh, for a while. If you look at... Um, the pound or the euro or the yen, you can see uh, real gains for those currencies against the greenback today. So um, that's interesting. Bitcoin is uh, up about one and a half percent, but it's still holding at the $30,000 level. So 29,878, uh, it had come down and, and back up a little bit. And by the way, you see gold also doing a heck of a lot of nothing right now around $2,000 uh, a troy ounce. Anna, what do you see in terms of the European markets this morning? Mm. Doing a little bit more than nothing, but not much more. Up by three tenths of one percent on the stocks 600 this morning. So pretty broad get, brace at uh, gains across European equity markets, if not stellar. A couple of individual stocks to focus on. EasyJet up by 2.7 percent. The low-cost airline uh, guiding the market higher for the second time in just su some uh, short number of months, and also suggesting that the summer period is going to be strong for this business. Ericsson down by seven percent. The telecom equipment company. Uh, the numbers themselves came in better than expected, but they're looking ahead to something that looks choppy for 20. 23, and they're suggesting that some of those uh, geographies that have already spent a lot on 5G might be dialing back their willingness to, expect, to, to spend more. And the pound is up half a percent then, Matt. Uh, to your point earlier, we have seen some weakness in the dollar, and so the pound is the other side of that. The euro also gaining, but the pound gets an added boost today because of the strength of the wage data. Still a tight labour market. The wages numbers were expected to come down, actually jumped higher for yet another month, and we look ahead to inflation data out of the UK tomorrow. That's going to be crucial. A piece of the jigsaw of course, around, uh, around the UK uh, central bank story. 
Yeah, we're going to continue to watch um, the macro data and talk about what that does to markets. Joining us right now is Chris Watling, CEO and Chief Market Strategist at Longview Economics. And Chris, you know, before we get to um, what's happening at the Bank of England, at the Fed, et cetera, let's talk a little bit about earnings season. What are you expecting? Um, because markets seem to be rising into it, and I thought we would see a big drop. So many people are forecasting a recession has already started. Yeah, that's right. Um, but it's often the way, isn't it? I mean, people get gloomy ahead of earnings season or, or very optimistic ahead of earnings season. And then you get the op opposite playbook. So we had a lot of gloominess coming into this earnings season. So it's pretty easy for these companies to beat. And to be honest, it's pretty early days as well. I mean, we really only kicked off in earnest with the major banks on Friday. So we're really a couple of days into earnings season. But yes, they're surprising more than is expected. I think the aggregates beat to date seven percent, and and normally across the season it's a three or four percent is the is the typical aggregate EPS beat. So, yeah, I mean, I think I mean I wouldn't read too much into this. I think the most important thing is what's going to happen to earnings over the course of this year when we start to price in proper recessionary earnings and uh, squeeze on margins. But I thought a couple of the regional banks had some quite interesting comments yesterday. One or two talking about pressure on loan books, which I thought was was interesting and provision for loan losses going up. So so it's early days, but um, it's often the way you come in gloomy and, and you typically beat. So, it, you know, we were set up this year for the markets to kind of tank in the first half and then recover by the end of 2023. What's your view of the, you know, medium to longer term of what happens in the S&P? Well, markets never do what's obvious. That's that's always the tricky thing. Um, so, I mean, I think we're 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 rallying from mid-March lows, and I think that'll continue. We're, as you mentioned uh, uh, a few minutes ago, we're up sort of six, seven percent or so from those levels, and I I think that'll continue throughout April. April's typically a good month. Risk appetite was very fearful in mid-March at the depths of that uh, banking crisis. There was some policy response. And so positioning's got to change and, and markets should rally, I think, through into May, that sort of time. Um, but then I'd be much more concerned about, about, about equity markets. I think by then people have started to change their stance. Uh, I know people talk a bearish game, but if you look at some of the sentiment indicators, not all of them, there's quite a mixed signal, but some of them are actually at quite high levels compared to where they were back in October last year when they were deeply, deeply, deeply fearful and bearish. So, so I think, I think positioning has been moving. And I think we'll find, give it another month or so, uh, that we're ready for a pullback. And I think it's going to be a tough second half. So we came into yeah. this year, as you said, with expecting a bad first half, better second half. I suspect it might be the other way around. So you see a near-term stock rally then, uh, uh, Chris. Narrow, though, you suggest it will be. And then you see something more negative later on in the year. I mean, how negative is that? And tie that into the conversation around recession. How do the two things uh, develop and trade around each other? Well, the, the recession story, I think, is still absolutely there. And I think the second half of this year, we're going to start seeing that, that bite. I mean, if you look at GDP in a lot of Western economies for the last six or 12 months, depending on where you look, it's basically flat. A lot of them haven't really had much growth, you know, up a bit on one quarter, down a bit on the next one and so on. But the UK is a great example. But Germany in the last couple of quarters, it's is sort of flat in the last quarter. So, so you can see that sort of slowing growth is developing, and I think it'll evolve into a recession. The, the banking crisis is going to tighten credit conditions more in the States, and, and money continues to get tighter in Europe and so on and so forth. And, and you look at monetary metrics, we see contracting money supply across much of the West. So I think second half is recession. I think that's, that's the playbook. And earnings need to adjust significantly. And, and let's not forget, margins were at record levels across the West in 2022. And they were boosted by the pandemic and the strange economic activity. So you've got to normalize margins and then you've got to price in recession. So earnings have got considerable potential downside from here. Mm. And multiples in the U.S. still extraordinarily high. Yeah. Uh, let me ask you about inflation then. You, you say that it is on the way down and you, 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 in your notes ahead of our conversation, you give a lot of detail about where that where that uh, where we've got to in that uh, path of bringing inflation down. Where does it go down to, though, Chris? What does the quote unquote new normal on inflation look like? Does it look like something the Fed, the BOE and the ECB would want it to look like or is it at elevated levels? Well, you know, I think what, what, what we've really got now is we've got central banks looking in the rearview mirror and, and responding accordingly. So I think we've got more volatility in inflation. So in other words, I think they, they were too loose in 2020 and 21. 
They've been too tight in the last few months and they've over tightened. And so actually, I think the risk we're looking at is deflation over the next 12 plus months. That, that is a growing risk out there. And then we'll get another aggressive policy response, I'm sure. So I think there's going to be more volatility inflation over coming years. And I suspect on average, it'll be higher. Uh, but as I say, on the, on the way to that, we, I think we're heading uh, certainly in the States and probably elsewhere towards negative uh, inflation, deflation over the course of the next 12 or so months. What does that mean for the Fed then, especially a Fed that has been telling us over and over um, that there will be no rate cuts this year? Well, the Fed's going to have to move quickly. I mean, once we start to see this recession really come to bite, the Fed's going to start changing its, its mind fairly quickly. And I think especially if you, if you get more financial stability issues and perhaps more dramatic ones, it's perfectly plausible. Money remains tight. So that's a quite likely outcome, I would have thought. So, yeah, I think the Fed will, will, will change its mind swiftly. And people often say they become entrenched in their view. How are they going to change? But over the years, you've seen the Fed, uh, I suppose, being somewhat practical. And, and, and as Keynes said, when the facts change, they change their minds. So I, I, I think the Fed will be pretty quick to, to shift around when it needs to. OK, Chris, thanks so much for joining us. Chris Watling of uh, Longview Economics Thanks. bringing us his thoughts on the near term and the longer term. Coming up on the programme, we'll talk tech. Netflix kicks off big tech results. That's later today. More on what to expect next. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. If you're looking live at the Principal Room. Coming up later today, an interview with the actor and investor, football fan, soccer fan, Brian Reynolds, 1.30 New York time. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Anna Edwards in London with Matt Miller in New York. Let's turn our attention to Netflix. It reports results later today. Bloomberg's Alex Webb joins us now with a look at what we can expect. Alex, good morning. So what's the focus going to be on? Two things, basically. On the first... Uh, first thing is that they have introduced this advertising-supported tier. It's quite a bit cheaper than the, you know, basic tier prior to that. It also has the potential to generate more revenue per user some stage than does even the top tier because if you're getting you know the subscription fee plus maybe seven dollars of advertising revenue for each user that could tip them above that number now any progress in that direction there's going to be a large amount of attention but also whether it's reducing churn reducing the number of users who are dropping netflix in favor of other services the second piece is very much on the password control element they had said they're going to crack down on people sharing passwords multiple different users also, essentially, to try to prop up the number of people who are paying. Mm. Are they making progress on that? Those two things are the, are the main, uh, main questions they're challenging. So no more stealing Netflix. In terms of um, how the market judges them, Alex, you know, how much slack will investors give if they miss expectations? And what are the most important expectations? Because sometimes, you know, they care about the spend, the cost um, to make these uh, productions. Sometimes they care about the subscribers. What are we focused on most? I mean, it's very much sub subscriber base and how that is developing, how much of those subscribers are coming from the advertising supported tier, and then how quickly, as, we, as I was just talking about, that advertising supported tier is increasing revenue per user like there's I think a little bit of patience with Netflix given that this the uh, price to earnings ratio has come down quite considerably over the past year or so it's still recovered a little bit it's trading about 28 29 times forward earnings you know a, a, a light miss might not be punished too severely it's really though those subscriber numbers that are going to be the focus of attention okay maybe they'll just be happy if love is blind doesn't get too much of a mention alex thanks very much alex webb joining us with the latest on netflix that report uh, due out later today coming up goldman sachs and bank of america also reporting today they're out with earnings later this morning we will discuss that octavia morenzi joins us optimus co-founder and ceo to talk banks shortly this is bloomberg